Amen. That's right. Well, happy Mother's Day to all the moms that are here this morning. And uh, just like that video expresses, uh, sometimes a good godly mother can be a glimpse of God, um, not only to her children and to her family, but to the world. And uh, I know that's a huge, man, it's like this huge build up, right? This huge pressure on mothers today. But uh, man, I want you to know if you're a mother here this morning, uh, the difference you have made in your life, the difference you can make in the future in your life uh, by being a holy example. I shared this in first service is that Mother's Day is uh, one of the preacher's favorite days of the year because it is traditionally the third highest attendance of the year for a service. And that's because uh, there's, there's always, you know, uh, Easter, and then there's always Christmas, and then there's Mother's Day, and it's a lot of times because moms, well, they do. What, what, what can I give you on Mother's Day? It's like, oh, please come to church with me, right? And so I know some of you are here this morning probably because, you know, it's like, mom, mom wanted me to be here, so I'm here. Or maybe you brought your mother this morning, and that's awesome too. Hey, we just want to say welcome. We're thankful that you're here today, and we do want to just recognize Mother's Day and, uh, you know, Jesus uh, loved his mother so much that when he was on the cross, one of his concerns was him, him taking care of Mary, his mother. And so we know it's a high priority in God's kingdom. Uh, so thank you for the work that you do. Um, today's message is, is, is going to be kind of a Mother's Day themed message, but it's not just the application. It's not just for moms. It's, it's for God's people universal. And so I think you'll, uh, you'll get a lot out of that. And as I was thinking of moms and mothers, I was thinking, you know, moms, they, a lot of times they teach us a lot of things. You know, they have all these roles and all these hats that they wear, you know, some moms are the financiers of the home and they take care of this and then they're maybe the primary, um, <clears throat> you know, caretakers of the home, they clean and, um, and then they're the primary schedule keeper, keepers of the home, they keep the calendar for the family and, and they're also the, the primary, um, you know, homework, you know, helping the kids with homework, they're the primary teachers of the family and I, I thought of some things that moms teach us and maybe you've heard of some of these uh, through the years, here's some things that mothers teach us and, and some mom one-liners that go along with it. Uh, mom taught us about religion when she'd say things like, you better pray that comes out of this carpet. <laughs> mom, moms taught us about air travel when they'd say things like, you better straighten up and fly right. <laughs> mom, moms taught us about foresight when they'd say, hey, make sure you always wear clean underwear just in case you're in an accident. Good sound advice there. Mom's taught us some weird things, though, like about uh, human anatomy and flexibility. Uh, does your mom ever say anything weird to you like, uh, look at this dirt on the back of your neck? <laughs> and I've been trying that for years, and I've not been able to do that. Mom's taught us about osmosis. You know the concept of osmosis when she'd say things like, shut your mouth and eat your food. And it's like, how do you eat food when your mouth is shut? Osmosis. Um, mom's taught us about envy. You know, there are millions of kids out there around the world that don't have good parents like you. Right, Mom. And also, Mom, as being a keen scientist and stuff, oftentimes she would teach us about weather when she'd say, it looks like a tornado came through this room. And you might remember some of those things. And we appreciate our moms, and it's, it's good to laugh, and it's good to, to celebrate them. The, this morning, we're going to be looking at a mom uh, from Scripture that was going through a situation that I think caused a lot of stress and anxiety. And I think being a mother today is an extremely unique thing. Now, I'm not saying if you were uh, raising your kids, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago, that somehow it's just, it's just so much harder today. But I feel like there's a unique set of challenges for mothers today. To answer the call to be the godly woman that God wants you to be and to be wearing all of these hats and all of these different roles in the home, mothers are uniquely called and uniquely qualified by God as holy women to not only be household managers, but to be spiritual spark plugs in their family. To be, to be the, one of the ones that, that uh, is constantly turning people's attention toward Almighty God. But I think there's a lot of pressure that can happen with that. I think there's a lot of pressure in, in, in being a mother today. You know, we expect moms to be these spiritual wonder Wonder Woman, right? It's just, she's a spiritual Wonder Woman, and she you know, does her devos on the Bible app every day, and, and she has an hour of prayer. She gets up at 4.30 so she can have a prayer and, and, and a devo time. And, and you know, there's all these expectations. You know, she's, she volunteers in the nursery three out of four Sundays a month. I mean, she's just amazing. She, she never nags, never complains. 
She's never depressed or sad. She's never worried or sick or selfish or grumpy in any way. She's even able, she's amazing. Moms have this expectation. You're even able to work out in the garden and not get dirty just like Martha Stewart. It's amazing. And moms, we know the expectations on you when it comes to child rearing. Your children sit quietly in church, singing the worship and praise songs, taking notes during the sermon. I mean, your kids are absolutely amazing. They always have their manners right. They always say please, and they always say thank you uh, perfectly. They never interrupt adults, you know, when they're having conversations, and, and they're, just, they're, they're just wonderful, perfect children. And you see, you, you say all these things, and we kind of laugh, and it's, it's good to do that, but at the same time, I think there's real expectations and, and sometimes r- real stress and pressure on, on mothers today. And I think it's, that life just seems so complex. And when you have things like, you know, Facebook and, and, and other types of social media, moms get on there and they see, you know, well, look at this mom, man. She's so much better than I am. She's so much prettier than I am. She has it together more than I do. We get in this comparison trap, right? But I, I think that we need to take a step back and understand that, that moms are also human. Moms are also sinners. I, I, I love something that, that my wife has taught me uh, just in the past few months. Uh, she, she told me uh, that parenting is sinners raising little sinners. <laughs> and it's like it's an imperfect proposition, right? It's an imperfect proposition. You're not going to get it right 100% of the time. But don't be discouraged in that. In our passage today, we're going to be in 1 Kings 17, so I invite you to turn there if you uh, brought your Bible this morning. If you didn't bring it, there's one there around you, but we also encourage you, if you have a phone or a tablet, to get on that device this morning and uh, download the Oakwood app if you haven't already. If you go in the Oakwood app, go to Sermon Notes, all the scripture and all the bullet points will be there for you, and there's even a way for you to take notes on there and save them if you'd like. We want you to interact with the, the message and the Word of God this morning, 1 Kings chapter 17. This story, just to give you a little bit of background, is a time where the prophet Elijah was called to go to a certain place called Zarephath. And there he encounters a single mom. Now this single mom is single by circumstance because we read in the text that she is a widow. Her husband, and we don't don't know how, we don't know the circumstances surrounding his, his passing, but we know that he's passed away. And so she's, she's a single mom, and she's in some, some circumstances. Let's read about it here. First, first Kings uh, chapter 17, verse 7 is what it says. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Now let me give you a, a, just a little bit of understanding to why that is significant. If you go back up in chapter 17 to uh, verse 1, it says now, Elijah, who's a, a prophet of God, it says, uh, he said, Uh, that God said uh, this, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Elijah Elijah makes this statement, there will not be dew or rain. Now, I I was thinking back uh, of a stretch a a few years ago here in Oklahoma where I think we went like 54 days without rain. And it was, I remember it was like, you know, late June, July, part of August. and, And you know what we call those the hot dog days of summer here in Oklahoma. And I remember the, the ground being so dry that it was like just crying out for moisture. Okay, that was what, you know, I can't remember exactly, 52, 54 days, something like that. It was, you know, it was some kind of a record or something. But can you imagine, years, no rain. Years, no rain. To the point that even the irrigation is drying up. Let's go back to verse 7 now, First. 1 Kings 17, 7. Some time later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. Long time. Then the word of the Lord came to him, and this is the prophet Elijah. Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and, and stay there. I have directed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks And he called to her and he asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? And as she was going to get it, he called, and bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it. And die. 
Now we read that, and you may think, wow, she's being a little dramatic here. But, no water in the land, no crops being produced. You can't squeeze the olives for any oil because all the olive trees are dying. It was pretty desperate times. Yeah, she may not have literally, you know, ate this last meal with her son and then just passed away, but I think what she was saying was, there's no more food, there's no more substance for me and my son, this is it, this is our last meal. And so, yeah, she's feeling pretty desperate that they may eat this last meal and then die. Verse 13, Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. Now, that's a big ask. Think about it. She only has this much resource left. He says, hey, go home, make some bread for me, bring it to me, and then you'll go back home and whatever's left over, you know, you'll have that for you and your son. But look at verse 14. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The jar of flour will not be used up, and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Wow, what a promise. Verse 15. She went away and she did as Elijah had told her. And so there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word the Lord had spoken by Elijah. Now that's kind of the first part of the story here. There's almost like this pause, and now we're going to pick this up. And we don't know what the timeline here is. We don't know if this is weeks later, if this is months later. But we're going to say, well, the Scripture says it. Sometime later, verse 17, sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. And she said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Give me your son, Elijah replied. And he took him from her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying and laid him on his bed. And then he cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? And then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord, my God, let this boy's life return to him. And the Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the child and carried him down from the room into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, look, your son is alive. And then the woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. What is God saying to us through this passage today? What does God expect of us? Because these are some circumstances, some real-life circumstances that may even lead to some real-life questioning. Things like, why did this happen to me? And what is our response to be when life happens? I hope this is an encouragement to mothers, but also to all believers this morning. I want to share three thoughts. The first one is this. Serve me when you don't understand how. God is saying to us, serve me when you don't understand how. Okay, Elijah is a prophet. A lot of times when we hear the word prophet, we think of the Old Testament. We think that a prophet is someone who always knew the future. Uh, in fact, some people would, would think that prophets are, are like fortune tellers. You know, they just predict the future and they tell people what's going to happen. Now, that was a skill that many prophets had, but that was not their job. The prophet's job was to present to God's people what they had done wrong, Sometimes in the form of a warning, hey, because of this, this is what's going to happen in the future. But their job was to encourage those people to repent 
and to come back to God, to repent and to go back and restore the relationship with God. That is always the prophet's job in Scripture. And we see that on a macro level, as they're calling the nation of Israel or the tribe of Judah, or, you know, we see this on a large scale, but we also see it on a personal scale as we do in this story and in this context, the prophet coming to a widow in Zarephath and spending some time there. And God challenges this lady who, remember when he came to her, she was gathering sticks. It says she's gathering sticks and twigs. What she was doing is she was gathering that to go home, to put that in, in, the, in, in the fire and, and to cook this bread. And she said, this is going to be my last meal with my son. And then, we're, you know, we're done. Then, then we're going to die because we have no more resources, nothing more to eat. The land is wiped out. We have no money. This is a desperate time. And yet through it all, you hear God saying through the prophet Elijah, serve me when you don't understand how. And while she's gathering those twigs for her last meal, and that's probably, if you think about it, that's probably all that's on her mind at the moment, then this prophet of God, Elijah, shows up. He comes to her unexpectedly. You see, God comes to us unexpectedly. Sometimes we don't understand. And the question that comes to us is when he comes to us unexpectedly in life, how will we respond? When he says, hey, serve me, when you don't understand exactly the how, how will we respond? Well, it's interesting because in our text we find out that this, this woman, this widow, she says yes. She answers yes, and the woman chose to serve the Lord and to serve his man appointed to come to her, Elijah. And though she can't completely understand how this is all going to work out, she operates in faith and moves forward and she chooses to serve him even though she doesn't understand the how reminds me of something i read about good leaders good leaders make decisions for the future when 80 to 90 percent of the information is in that's the difference between a a good leader and just an average leader as good leaders they'll they'll make that decision when they don't know it all but they've got 80 to 90 percent of the information in that's how she's feeling, I imagine. I, I know you're a man of God. I know that you're a prophet. I mean, she acknowledges that in those first few verses. But I don't know how this is going to work out. But you've asked me to get you water. You've asked me to bake you bread. Serve me when you don't understand how. The second thing from our passage this morning, follow me even when it's a risk. Follow me even when it's a risk. You see, we are called by God to do our part. It's called obedience. God makes it clear what the expectations for our lives are. And sometimes we think, but if I follow you, God, all the way in this area, if I follow you all the way in this area, I don't know what's going to happen. There is some risk involved here, and yet God would say, follow me, even when it's a risk. Guess what? Elijah had to do the same thing. Remember when we read up there at the beginning of chapter 17 and verse 1 where he says, hey, this, 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 this uh, famine, this drought is going to come upon the land for the next few years. It's, it's not going to rain. There's not going to be dew. I mean, there's going to be no moisture here. Then if you read the next little section there, you may have heard of this story and remember it. Elijah was fed by ravens. Ravens were feeding him. And then God says, hey, Elijah, I want you to go to the village of Zarephath in the middle of this whole thing. And guess what? I'm going to have a little old widow take care of you. You see, Elijah the prophet, the leader, the man of God, the voice of God, also had to choose to follow God even when it was a risk. And just like God comes to us sometimes unexpectedly, God also provides for us unexpectedly. God provides for us 
in unexpected ways. We see this all throughout Scripture. I was thinking of biblical examples, and I, I could give you a hundred. I, I was thinking of one uh, like Abraham. You know, Abraham is called to, to go to this mountain. He's to take Isaac with him and a few of his servants, and he's to go up on this mountain and offer a sacrifice. And as he goes along the way, he, he, beca- he comes under this, this thought that he's going to sacrifice Isaac. And Isaac's like, hey, we didn't bring any goats. We didn't bring any sheep, Dad. What are we going to do? And Abraham, what does he say all along? God will provide the sacrifice. He gets to the point, he puts Isaac on the altar. He ties him down. He's raising his knife and he's about to take his own son's life. And how did God show up in that circumstance? You you, you think there's some risk involved in it? God stops him from sacrificing his son. And and it's amazing because we see this all throughout Scripture that God provides he provides even for his own mission and his self and his plan. He provides what? It was a, it was a ram with, it, with its horns you know, stuck in a thicket over here. God provided the sacrifice. But nonetheless, Abraham was called to follow him even when there was risk. But we see all throughout Scripture that God provides. And it's, it's amazing that God needs a sacrifice. His rule from the beginning was if there's sin, something has to die. And that was what the whole sacrificial system of animals was in the Old Testament. The blood covers sin. The blood covers sin. And it's amazing that God would even go to the nth degree here and provide the sacrifice himself. And you know where I'm going with this. Even unto Jesus Christ, his his only begotten son, he will actually allow Jesus to die. He's a God who provides for us in so many ways. You know, Amy and I have experienced this in so many miraculous ways through the years. Just, just We have so many cool stories of, of, of God's provision. I, I, I was thinking, thinking of that this week. There was a time where we were um, just felt immense financial pressure because of medical bills. We just had medical bills mounting up with some, with some surgeries that, that one of our daughters had to have. And, and I just remember God supernaturally providing someone that, that was an acquaintance of ours, a, a friend of the family kind of, kind of deal. Um, they, they had, had received uh, some money and, and got, they'd been praying about what they needed to do with it. And God had told them to uh, write us a check for $1,000 and to send it to us. And it was funny because that week, you know, you know how medical stuff works with insurance sometimes? You think you're done paying and then, oh, but wait, there's more. <laughs> you forgot the anesthesiologist. And they don't like to bill till next year. So next year, you know, it's one of those times we thought we were, okay, man, we, we survived. Woo, we survived that surgery. We paid everything off, and here comes that bill. And I just remember that, that very week that, that happened, we'd received a bill that was like a thousand, it was just over a thousand dollars, like a thousand and three dollars. And we were like, man, you know, we're, we're, how are we going to do this? And then God supernaturally provides. God, God supernaturally provides all the time in ways that we don't understand. Some of you are driving a car you have a car to church this morning that God's, God is sustaining your vehicle. You know, it is time for the transmission, but God continues to sustain it. And you're like, how's God providing for me? I'm really struggling. Guess what? Your transmission still works. And he got, it was good enough to get you here on mom's day, right? To get you to church. So God has so many different ways that he's going to provide for us. An unexpected Okay, Amy and I weren't, weren't, weren't like, you know, praying this prayer of expectation. Oh, Lord, send us a $1,000 check in the mail from someone we don't know very well. That wasn't our prayer. It came to us unexpectedly. And all throughout Scripture, you see God providing unexpectedly for his people. And I think for this widow, for this single mom, you, you think about this. God used a widow as a supply chain for his kingdom's work. Because what did it say there in the the text? Look at verses uh, 15 and 16. She went away and she did. She obeyed. She she trusted the Lord. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for who? For Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the woman and her son. I mean, you think about this. This this, this is amazing. That God is using this widow to not only supply for herself in the middle of this drought and this famine, but to also provide food for God's kingdom, for God's worker. And you, and you think about that, and it's amazing. Do you think she expected that? <laughs> Absolutely not. But because she was faithful, because when God said, follow me, follow me, when God said, follow, even when it was risky, she said, okay, okay, I'm going to follow you. 
And as a result, she not, didn't provide one meal for a prophet. She provided many meals for a long time for the prophet and for her family. You see, to accomplish his purposes, God uses whatever you have wherever you are. You need to understand that. To accomplish his purposes, God will use whatever you have wherever you are. You see this all throughout the Bible too. You remember the story? Jesus was teaching. 5,000 people listening. They've been sitting there for hours just, just hanging on his every word. They get hungry. Okay, the McDonald's walkthrough in the next town was not capable of handling 5,000. So Jesus is like, you know, we have problems. Disciples are very concerned. Oh, Jesus, we got problems. What are you doing to these people? They are hungry. You keep teaching. They keep, you know, their stomachs keep growling. What are we going to do here? And do you remember the little boy? I, I, I can't feed 5,000. But I, I got, I'll just give you my lunch. I got five loaves and two fish. And you know the story. Jesus takes it and he blesses it. And he says, start passing it out. And supernaturally, if he's 5,000, and I was just counting the men. That wasn't the women and children. Probably more like 20,000. And isn't it amazing how, again, God provides unexpectedly. Follow me. You know, I think sometimes this comes down to a test of faith for us. There, there, there's this testing that happens in it. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. That's faith. Sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. I don't know that this widow had perfect faith, but I know she had faith enough. Maybe it was the size of a mustard seed. To take a step forward and to choose to follow God even when there was a risk. The third thing and the last thing this morning is trust me. Trust me when trouble and tragedy come your way. Trust me when those times of struggle and trouble and pain, and anguish, and stress, when those times come, trust me, trust me even more. When tragedy strikes, let's look at, look at verse 17 of our text. Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, look at her initial reaction here, because I think we can relate to this. What do you have against me? Man of God, what do you have against me? I mean, you think about this widow who lost her husband. Could anything worse possibly happen to her but her son, the only one mentioned in our text, is taken away from her? And you think stressed out, tragedy comes. And I think her, her cry here, when she says, what do you have against me, is what so many cry. Maybe it sounds more like this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Wait. I've heard that before. And we get desperate. And we cry out. And we have those moments of desperation. And, and, and when you get to that point, it is a tough and it is a challenging feeling. It's a tough road. But it's in those times of stress, it's in those times of, of trouble and strife where the core question of our faith is, do you trust the Lord? Even when, even if, do you trust the Lord? Because he's asking us, and he's telling us here in the text even, and he's showing us, trust me when trouble and tragedy come your way. Trust me in the good times, but oh, please, ever more so, trust me in the times of struggle. And you get to the point you have to ask yourself, do I really, truly trust in the Lord? Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. And it's in those times 
that we find out that God is faithful. God is always faithful regardless of the circumstances. God is always faithful regardless of the circumstances. If God chose to take her son, even though there's pain in that mother's heart, and even though there's anguish, if God had chosen to not allow her son to be resurrected from the dead, mind you, yes, our God has the power over death. Is she going to need the Lord going forward? Maybe even more so. Is God going to take care of her? Maybe even more so. Is she going to choose to depend on him? You know, I, I was thinking of that song we sing sometimes, Waymaker. Sometimes we sing that song, Waymaker. It has some great lines in it. It talks about the work of the Lord going on. And one of the lines in it says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop working. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. And even when I don't feel it, God's working. You never stop. You never stop working. And as we read the rest of the text, it says what? The, the widow's son comes back to life again. And God says, look at me now. Trust me. Believe in me, even when you don't see it, and even when you don't feel it, I'm working. I've got a plan. It's ultimately good for you. Look at the last, the last verse, verse 24 of our text. It says, when the woman, then it says, then the woman, so he's, he's raised her son from the dead. He's brought the boy downstairs and placed him in his mother's arms. She's obviously overwhelmed. I can't imagine what the emotions for a mother would be at that moment. It says, then the woman said to Elijah, now I know, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. But let me tell you what Jesus said in John chapter 20, verse 29. Jesus said this, because you have seen me, you have believed, but blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. You see, there's this faith factor in all of this. When God comes to you in life, in circumstances of your drought and of your time and your season of, of famine, when you don't even maybe know what, what, what else could possibly happen, God says, hey, serve me when you don't understand how. Follow me even when it's a risk. And trust me, especially when the times of trouble and tragedy come your way. Because it's in these times you're going to find a faithful God. You're going to find a God who will provide for you. You're going to find a God who will get you through, who's going to walk you through this time, even when it doesn't make sense. You're going to find that in those times of stress, in those times of tragic loss, that I am the one who's close to you and that I'm the one that's going to take care of you. And even on this Mother's Day, the amazing gift of God is that He sacrificed for us. He sent his only son, Jesus, to be a sacrifice, to be the substitutionary atonement for our sin. And this is our story as Christians. This is the story of Jesus. His love for you is greater than the love of an earthly mother. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He will not turn his back on you. He will not reject you. He will not desert you in the hard times. He loves you so much that he died for you so that he could wash you white as snow, wash your sins away. You can be forever forgiven and forever remembered in the Lamb's book of life because of what Jesus did. And when life is tough, where are you turning? The world says, hey, turn to psychology and turn to this and turn to this. We turn to God. We first always turn to God. And I don't know what season you're in, what's going on in your life right now, and you may feel like, man, I'm in the middle of a drought here. This is getting desperate. Could it be any worse? And maybe, maybe you are, are like the widow here, and, and you're, you're crying out. What do you have against me? And God's saying, hey, serve me. 
follow me and trust me because I love you and I'm always going to provide what you need. As we respond to this message this morning, we're going to get to take communion together and hopefully you grab those elements as you came in. If you're with us online, hopefully you've made those preparations at home. God is a God who always provides everything that we need. Everything that we need. And just as I gave the example earlier of Abraham and Isaac, that sacrifice, it's amazing how many times God provides his own sacrifice, even unto Jesus Christ. I mean, isn't it amazing when you think about it? We should be making a sacrifice. We should be called to sacrifice something. And yet, it is God that seems over and over and over again to be providing the sacrifice. Even to the point where the substitutionary atonement for our sins is provided in His Son. And as you take this bread this morning that represents, it's supposed to be a a remembrance, a memorial of Jesus' body. And as you take this cup that represents His blood, I want you to remember that God provided the sacrifice in His Son. And because of that, we have what? The free gift of grace and forgiveness that is only found in Him. And all you have to do is to call on the name of Jesus, put your faith in Jesus, repent and turn away from your sin, and follow Him. And God is a God who will always provide. Let's pray, and then let's take communion this morning. Lord God, I thank you for this time where we can take and and break bread together. Lord, it's amazing to think how you provided. God, as I was thinking, as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem on Holy Week, you you provided the donkey. He he told the disciples, go to this house, and these people are going to give you their donkey to use, and, and it happened. Lord, we see in Holy Week how you provided this upper room. Who, who knew? Who, who knew the person that owned the room? And, and Lord, the, the, the Passover meal has so many parts. You, you, you've got to have the bread, the unleavened bread, and you've got to have the, the, the juice or the, or the wine in that time. You, you've got to have the bitter herbs, and you, you've got to have the egg, and you've got to have the bone, and you've got to have all these things, and yet you provided that meal the memorial meal when when Holy Communion was established. God, you're a God that provides even in the details of life, even in the small things and in the large things. And God, you provided for us a way to have reconciliation with you, a way to become holy and pure that through the repentance of our sins and the blood of your Son, we can be washed white as snow. We can walk in newness of life. And God, we thank you so much for that. I pray this morning, God, as we take this communion, you remind us that you are the God that provides, even providing through your Son. As we take this bread, as we take this cup, God, we do it to honor you and to remember you. Thank you for your Son. And thank you for the hope that we have because of him. We pray all these things in his strong and powerful name. Amen. If you would, take a few moments and commune with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.